Lord, we've heard a beautiful song that is a reminder of, Lord, our desire to follow Jesus, and Lord, that there would be no turning back. Lord, we think of this pursuit of Abram and his wife Sarai, and Lord, their passionate pursuit of you, and Lord, in that journey of ups and downs, of twists and turns, Lord, how there was no turning back, yet, Lord, what we recognize is that there are moments, certainly, where we can either run too far ahead, where we can lag too far behind. And yet, Lord, what we would ask is that as we study your word and what you have for us, that we would be in the very center of your very perfect will. And so, Lord, in our time together, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive what it is that you have for us this morning. Lord, in our pursuit of Jesus, Lord, there would be no turning back. And so we bring all of these things before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been with us over the past couple of weeks, we've actually been working our way through a series of messages entitled All In. And the whole purpose behind this series has been for us to be thinking together about, as we study the life of Abram and his wife Sarai, what does it mean for us to be in this passionate pursuit of God? And what I hope as we've studied this together is that we've been able to learn, I hope you've been as blessed in receiving it as I have been in preparing for it and in studying and just in looking together at this text in hopefully some fresh ways and with some fresh eyes. What I've loved has been our, our guide that we've been using in addition to Scripture, the book by Anne Graham Lotz, The Magnificent Obsession, that has really provided us with some additional thoughts along the way. What I've been so grateful for is last week as Pastor Andrew was telling us a little bit about that, often some copies of this as well as a book brought by Brother Lawrence of trying to say, hey, these are some of the resources that we've been using as we've been studying and preparing. How great it would be for all of us to be able to be studying outside of the Sunday morning experience and to continue learning and growing on our own. And what I appreciate has been some of the additional thoughts that have been added to our study together each and every week. One of the things that we recognize as we've been working our way through this series is there's a lot about Abram's life and background that we don't know. And so in some ways, you're doing a little bit of reading between the lines and a little bit of speculation. Now, here's where we always have to be careful as pastors. We don't want to preach simply based on speculation or reading between the lines. We want to be faithful to the text that God has given to us but because we really don't know a lot about Abram's background, there is some sense of trying to figure out and understand why do some of the people make the decisions that they do. Now, as we've been studying through and walking through the book of Genesis together, one of the things that we recognize is there were moments as Abram and his wife stepped out in this journey that perhaps they were stepping ahead of where God wanted them to be. And so as we were looking at how they traveled down to Egypt, maybe there was a sense that they had moved ahead of where God wanted. They were stepping outside of God's will. Of course, we don't know. It could have been God who was directing them all along. But here's what we know, that no matter what the case, that because God is sovereign, God takes all of the decisions, all of the things that Abram and his wife have done, and we see the way in which God has been working working it both for their good as well as for God's glory. And here's the thing, because Abram was a man just like us, you and I know that as we walk out our faith and our journey, that there are going to be moments when we, we get it right and when we're in the center of God's will. And we also know that there are going to be moments when we screw up. Right When we make mistakes, maybe we move outside of God's will, and yet what we see is how God is using all of these things to teach us and to grow us. God is always going to be faithful to his promises. And so in week one, we spent a little bit of time looking about at this idea of how we can leave 
everything behind in our pursuit of God, but yet we saw how Abram didn't quite leave everything behind, how he took his family with him and how that would would affect generations to come. Last week, we spent a little bit of time talking about how we can entrust everything completely to God, that yes, there are going to be moments when we, we wonder And we worry and we say, God, are you really there? Do you really hear me? Are you really listening to me? And yet what we learn is that in the middle of our doubts, God comes to us and says, I want you to know that you can trust me because I am a faithful God. I am the ultimate promise maker and I am the ultimate promise maker keeper and even when you are faithless i will remain faithful what does timothy say that if we are faithless he remains faithful for he cannot disown himself and so what we see is that it's god who comes to us in those moments when we feel like everything is hopeless but here's what happens in those moments when we're waiting on god When we wonder, God, I know that you've made these promises to me. You've said that you're going to be faithful. And then we have those moments where we have to wait. How many of us have ever had those situations where we feel like God isn't moving quite as quickly as we think God should? As quickly as we would want God to move. Today we're going to be talking about how we can pursue everything patiently. I want to begin by asking you a question. How many of you like to wait? Right. And how many of you specifically, when you feel as though God has given a promise to you, and God has said, this is something that I'm going to do for you, how many of you don't mind waiting for God to fulfill that promise? None of us do. Right? And so what do we have a tendency to do? When, when we get tired of waiting, and when we wonder where God is in the moment, what do we do? We run ahead of where God wants us to be instead of pursuing everything patiently. I think about that example. A lot of you know that we've been uh, doing some house renovations. There's been walls that have come down. There's been walls that have gone up. There's been flooring that's laid. There's been mudding. I mean, my knees hurt. My my shoulders hurt. My wrists hurt in ways that I, I had never thought they would hurt before. Now, I share this with you because I want you to understand how many of you have ever worked on a project before and you know the ultimate goal that you have in mind. You have a picture in your mind of what the end result is going to be and what can happen. We want to arrive at that goal a little more quickly than maybe we should, and so maybe we work a little too quickly. And in the process, we make some mistakes. I can think it was a a few weeks ago, I was putting in flooring in the house. It's all clicking in together. And I put in a row, and then I put in another row. And as I'm kind of tightening things up and hitting things in, suddenly, who would think that it could chip? And the vinyl tile would chip. And all of a sudden, you're thinking, oh, nuts. And now you have to take out a row in order to get back to the one that was broken. And you put it in, and you start all over again, and you do it again. You got to take it all out and you got to go back and you start all over again. And there were a few moments when somewhere along the way, I think there were two or three times in this same section where I was breaking tile and I start to get frustrated. And of course, you know that as you get more frustrated, all of a sudden you start working a little bit harder. You start hitting things maybe a little bit harder. And what ends up happening is you make more mistakes along the way because what you want to finish the project. Now I share that because how many of us are the same way? We have something that we see, a vision that we have in front of us, maybe a picture of something that God has promised us, and what do we do? We want to get there quickly. And in our desire to arrive at the end result quickly, we end up making mistakes. We take things in our own control, and all of a sudden we find ourselves having made some mistakes along the way. 
And life is like that. Sometimes when it feels like God isn't moving as quickly as we think he should, when God hasn't answered our prayers as quickly as we think he should, what happens? We panic. And we say, it's like, God, I know. I, like, I know you have the power to do the things that you've said you can do. God, I, I know that you keep saying that I should put my trust in you, that you have my best intentions at heart. And yet, when God isn't moving as quickly as we would like, what do we do? We make mistakes. We take things into our own control, and we end up screwing up. By the way, I, I love what Anne Graham Lotz has said in her book. I, I think this is such a, a, an incredible reminder. Instead of trusting that God may be intentionally delaying our prayers or fulfilling his promise to us because he has greater, higher purpose in mind than just giving us what we want, when we want it, the way we want it, here's her point. God uses these times because he wants us to develop our faith and learn to trust in him. Sometimes it's in those moments of waiting that God is saying, I want you to develop your trust in me. And that's hard. Because we want things to happen quickly. And we hear people say things like, well, the good book says God helps those who help themselves. Except, that's not what the Bible says. So, instead of saying, well, you know what, I'm just going to help myself. God, I'm going to move ahead of where you want me to be. What ends up happening is we make these mistakes and we, we take control. And, and that issue is something that we fail to remember that the decisions we make can f affect generations to come. And it, in what we're going to study today, you and I are still living into the choices that Abram and Sarai made. So this morning, if you've brought your Bibles, I want to spend some time together in Genesis chapter 16 as well as chapter 17. And, and what I hope we discover together is how you and I can pursue everything but do it patiently. We're going to pick up at verses 1 and 2. Listen to what it says. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, I want to stop right there because I want us to remember kind of what we were talking about last week. Remember, originally God said, Abram, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you into a great nation and all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. And what we learn is from that promise to where we were last week, 10 years have gone by. And so Abram has aged by 10 years. They would have looked at their bodies and said, you know what, this is impossible. God has renewed his promise to him. He takes Abram outside. He says, I want you to look at the stars in the sky. Your descendants are going to be more numerous than they. But here you have Abram. He's 85 years old. Sarai is 75 years old. They're not dumb. They, they know how babies come about. They know their bodies. They know that, okay, we're too old to have children. This is impossible. I want us to understand, this is not different than today's day and age. We all know people who have struggled, and maybe it's some of you who are here this morning or who are watching online, who've struggled with having children. You know the, the pain or the shame or the stares of the people that are around you. And you know the lengths to which people will go in order to conceive. And I want us to understand that if the pain and the stigma are difficult today, they would have been equally difficult, if not even more difficult in their day and age. You have to understand, a woman's worth was tied to her ability to have children. 
And the more children you were able to have and the more sons you were able to provide your husband, right, the more descendants, the more inheritance that was going to continue on, that in that day and age, you can imagine the stares of the people that were around Sarai. Because it was also tied up in, wow, if, if you have a lot of children, God is obviously blessing you. And if you're not having children, well, maybe something's going on, right? Maybe God has something wrong with you. And so you can imagine the, the thoughts that are going through Sarai's mind. And so as Sarai is looking around and she sees all of these other women who are able to have children, she looks at her own body and she says, look, it's impossible, I know physically that it is impossible for me in my old age to have children. Maybe she's ashamed. Maybe she's a little angry. She looks around and sees all of these other women bearing children. And so what does she do? She does the kind of thing that all of us might do. Right? In that day and age, I mean, they didn't have in vitro clinics. Today we do. We know people who maybe have said, you know what, I can't have children, so I'm going to go to some different clinics. I'm going to pay tens of thousands of dollars in order to have children. We know people who've said, you know what, I will be a surrogate womb for you. So you can take that egg and you can implant it in me and I will even carry your baby for you. They didn't have in vitro clinics back then. But they did have surrogate wombs. And so Sarai devises this plan. She has this light bulb moment that, you know what, this slave girl that came back for, with Egypt uh, with us, she says, you know what, God, I know that you made this promise to me, and I know that you said that you're going to provide me with children, but then all of a sudden it's like, but maybe this was the way. I've got this idea, and it's like, God, this is going to be the way. And, and you can imagine them thinking, you know, why didn't we think of this all along? Like, this is the way in which God is going to fulfill his promise. Now, it seems odd to us, but you have to understand that in that day and age, this was not necessarily out of the ordinary, right? Where if a woman couldn't conceive, maybe there was a family member in the household or somebody else in the household that it's like, you have children with her and I'm going to adopt this child as my own. And so Sarai has this plan. She goes to Abram and she says, hey, why don't you have a, a child with my servant Hagar. Now, I'm just going to guess that Abram wasn't like, sweet. You know, <laughs> like I get two women now, right? I mean, I'm going to guess that Abram knew God's design. He understood God's design for marriage. But there's something about the conversation that they're having with each other where suddenly Abram says, yeah, you know what, honey, I think you're right. Maybe this is the way in which God was going to fulfill his promise to us. Maybe there's something that we missed in the conversations that we had with God. And like, this is the way in which God is going to fulfill this promise. And here's what happens. Because God wasn't moving fast enough, they took things into their own control. And what does the Bible say in verse 2? Abram agreed to what Sarai said. And if you're following along and you want to take some notes this morning, this is the first thing that I want us to understand, that just because we go all in, it doesn't give us permission to run ahead of God. Just because we go all in, we're like, God, I am all in for you, it doesn't give us permission to run ahead of God. How many of us have ever done something like that? We, we sense God has given us a promise. Maybe it's, it's a family, or maybe it's a relationship, or maybe it's a job, or maybe it's a ministry, or maybe you've sensed God has given you a promise of physical health or healing, or God has promised salvation is going to come to a family member in your household. And what do we do when we feel like God isn't moving fast enough? We run ahead of where God wants us to be. Instead of waiting on God's promises, instead of pursuing everything patiently, we take control. We say, you know what, this is the situation that's happened. How many of us have ever said something like, well, these are the cards that I've been dealt in life? 
right? I got to deal with the cards that I've been dealt, and so why don't I just make the best of the situation that I see around me, and we step out ahead of God. By the way, what might that look like? Maybe for some of you, you, you marry the first person that comes along because you figure, I'll never find love, and I'll never find anyone better. And so you simply jump into a relationship with someone. Maybe you get divorced too quickly because you say, there's no hope for this relationship. I might as well just toss in the towel. You know, maybe, maybe we change jobs too quickly because we think, oh, this is going to be finally where I'm going to be able to provide better for my family. Maybe you cut corners at work because this is the way in which I'm going to be able to to get ahead. And what we end up doing is instead of pursuing things patiently, we step ahead of where God wants us to be. How often do we push our chips all in before we have clearly heard from God and pursuing His best? Notice, by the way, what it says in verses 3 to 5. So after Abram had been living in Canaan for 10 years, Sarai took his, or Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I have put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. See what happens? Because they didn't pursue God's best for them, and they pursued their best, see what happens is that the result of pursuing our best instead of God's. I want you to see that. This is the second thing this morning. That when we go all in, stop pursuing your best and start pursuing God's best. See, whenever we say things like, well, I'm just dealing with the cards that I've been dealt, right? My childhood was terrible. I didn't have parents who really ever loved me. I had so much financial and emotional and relational instability in my life. I've just never really felt loved. And so what do we start doing? We start making these decisions. And maybe we pursue things like alcohol or drugs or, you know, whatever it is in order to soothe the pain. However we feel like we are going to be able to escape from whatever it is that we're caught up in. And so what do we do? We enter into an abusive relationship with someone else because we think to ourselves, well, man, I'll never find anybody better, right? This is the best that I can ever have. Maybe we have children before we should because we're like, well, I've never experienced love before, so this is the way I'm going to be able to experience love. I'll have somebody to love, and somebody's going to love me in return. All of these different things that we do in order to find an escape. By the way, how many of us, think of the different ministries that we support, how many people do you think would say that they've made some of those choices in life for some of those very reasons? Think about a, a local ministry that we support like All Things New. How many people there would say that the, the result of where they are is because some of the choices that they've made because they've assumed this is the best I can do? Think about a, a local pregnancy center like Heartline. How many, how many women might say, you know what, I've made decisions for some of those very reasons? How many people from like fellowship missions would say something like that or right down the street like the Serenity House? But I want to be clear, this isn't just out there. This is in here. You know, when, when we turn to things like drugs or alcohol or the computer, because we think that these are going to be the things that are going to ease some of our pain. These are the things that we have to do in order to cope. We all make choices for different reasons, and we all are, are living into the decisions of people that have gone before us. But what do we do? We pursue our own best instead of waiting for God's best. 
we say things like, God, I know you are faithful. I know you can do the things that you say you can do. I know you have the power. But man, when we have to wait, all of a sudden the doubts and the questions start to come in and we start thinking, well, maybe I should do things on my own. Maybe I need to take control of this. And what do we do? We settle for the sizzle instead of getting the steak. And how true is that? We, we pursue our own best instead of waiting on God's best. And by the way, notice what happens. Let's go back to verses 5 and 6. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And notice what it says. Abram says, your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. You see what's happening here? Hagar, by the way, is having her moment. She, she was this slave girl, probably given to Abram and Sarai by Pharaoh, and now she's on this journey with Abram and Sarai, and all of a sudden, for whatever reason, Sarai notices her and, and says, hey, I've got this plan. I want you to go and sleep with my husband. And so she does. And she gets pregnant. And so now all of a sudden, maybe she's starting to think, well, now I'm moving up a little bit in this family. Now, maybe she's a little bit closer to Abram. Maybe her tent is a little bit closer to Abram's tent. And all of a sudden, maybe she looks at Sarai and is like, I'm able to have children and you're not. Maybe I'm a little more special than you are. And what happens? She begins to despise her mistress and she shows her contempt. And Sarai sees this and she sees she's not able to have children. And so all of a sudden she begins to despise Hagar. And all of a sudden she begins to show Hagar with all of this contempt, all because of her jealousy. And so what does Sarai do? She goes to her husband and says, this is all your fault. Come on, guys. How many of you have ever experienced that, right? This is all your fault. Now, I, 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 I want to be very clear about this. You know, at this point, Abram could have said, you know what, Sarah, we screwed up. We messed up. And it's time for us to fess up. We need to begin acting differently. You know what? He, Abram could have said, honey, we've run ahead of God and we've stepped outside of God's will for us and we need to make this right. We can't treat Hagar the way that we've been treating her. I want us to just begin to think about how would this world be different if not only they had made this choice to not do this, but at the same time, if they had chosen to treat Hagar differently in this moment and they had chosen to pursue God instead of pushing Hagar away. I think of time and time again when I've stepped outside of God's will for my life and I'm faced with a choice. I can either continue to run from God or I can say, you know what? I've screwed up. I've messed up. It's time to fess up. And it's time to start pursuing God again. And you and I are often faced with that choice. We can either keep running from God or we can say, you know what, I've made a mistake and I'm going to start running to God. But what do Abram and Sarai do? They continue to make the situation worse. And how did they do that? They treated Hagar so badly that she ran away. Here was this girl who was given to them, who was watching them pursue God. And then they treat her in this way to the place where she flees. I, I want us to understand this. She is watching them pursue this journey of faith and in the way in which they treated her, 
would cause her to say, why would I want this faith for my own? Why would I want God, if, if I see the way in which they're following God and this is the way in which they treat me, why would I want that God? And so she flees. And you and I have to understand that the way in which we live, the way in which we treat other people matters. I always say that what we believe needs to affect how we behave. And so if you and I are in this passionate pursuit of following God, but then the way in which we live and treat other people doesn't match that, what the damage is done where other people see that and say, you know what, I don't want that God. Heaven forbid we live in such a way that we would cause other people to flee from God. It should cause us to pause and to think about the way in which we live. And that leads to the third thing. Don't compound the problem by running away from God. Don't compound the problem. Notice what verse 6 says again. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. How many of us have ever done that? We've made a mistake and we compound the problem by making more stupid mistakes. And so now Abram and Sarai, they're in this journey where they're running away from God and they're, they've pushed Hagar and, and Hagar is running away from God. And you see what happens when we don't pursue everything patiently, we take things under our own control and we run away instead of running to the one who is the source of our hope, who is the source of our strength. And so instead of saying, God, I can't do this on my own, we say, God, I got this. And if I made this mistake, I'm going to get myself out of this mistake. And we keep making mistakes. But here's what I'm so grateful for, is that when you and I continue to make these kind of mistakes, there is always hope. Because it's God who comes to us. Picture this young, pregnant teenager. She is running from this family. She is alone. She is all by herself. And notice what happens. God comes to her. And God makes some promises to her. And he tells her, Hagar, I see you. You don't have to keep running. And God makes some promises to her and he says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Notice what verses 7 to 16 say. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Of course, God knows what's going on here, but he wants to understand her mind of thought. And so she says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son, and you shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live in hostility towards all of his brothers. I want us to understand this, that to this very day, these words are still true. If the Arabs point back to Ishmael, we see the strife that they live with, Sunni and Shia. We see the Muslim faith, and we also see how he's struggling with his his brother from another mother, okay? That sounds, uh, but that's what it is, right? So now you have Isaac as well, that he, they're in conflict with one another, the father of the Jewish people. And here's what I want us to know, that for people who say that the Bible ha isn't real, that it's just a bunch of made-up fairy tales, thousands of years later, the promise that God had made to Sarai and Hagar and Abram has come true. We are still living with those effects today. But ultimately what I want you to see is how it's God who comes to Hagar. And he says, I see you. Notice, if we continue on, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one 
who sees me. That is why that area, is, the well is called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. I want you to see God is faithful to his promises. He he made a promise to Hagar. He saw her. She was the one. She said, God, you have seen me. And we need to understand that God saw her. God was faithful to Hagar. And we need to see how God was faithful to Abram and to Sarah. Even though they couldn't see it in the moment. And even though they had run ahead of God, each one needed to be reminded that God sees them. That God is in control. That God is faithful. And God knew that Abram and Sarai needed to get back on track again. So I want to close this morning with this thought. A couple of weeks ago, we were saying how one of the things that we see in Abram and Sarai's life over and over again is that in this pursuit of God, they were going to make some mistakes and they were going to falter along the way. But what we said is that you can always return to God. There is always hope. And that's the last thing I want us to understand. It's never too late to start over. It's never too late to start over. At the end of chapter 16, Abram is 86 years old. And at the beginning of chapter 17, four more years have gone by. Think about that. Ishmael is four years old. Abram is 90. And his wife, Sarai, is 80 years old. But I love how God comes to him and says, Abram, it is never too late to start over. At the beginning of chapter 17, God makes this promise to Abram. He's renewing his covenant. Notice what it says. It says, when Abram was 90 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Lord Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. And I will make nations of you. And kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be your God. Here you have Abraham, who is now Abraham, who is living in limbo. And what happens? God comes to him. And I love this part because I want you to see God changes Abram's name. He's no longer going to be Abram. He's going to be Abraham. And what the rest of this chapter lays out is what's known as the covenant of circumcision where they would have to cut the foreskin of these men and i want us to understand abram is 90 years old and he's going to have to cut himself in a very painful place and in a very painful way but i also want us to understand sometimes When you and I start over, there's going to be pain. When God gives us a new name and sets us on a new path, not only will God change your name, 
But in that process, there might be some pain that's involved. It's not always going to be easy. In fact, turning your life around never is. But sometimes in order for something good to come about, it often requires something of us. It requires us being willing to leave something behind. It requires us being willing to give up something. It requires us saying, God, I don't want to be in control of my own life anymore. I want you to be in control. And what that might mean is that God has to break something in us or something of us Why? So that we can lean more on God. So that we can trust more in God instead of in ourselves. Beloved people, God wants to give you a new name. And you need to know it is never too late to start over again. If you're in a place where you feel as though you have been running from God, if you feel like you have been pursuing your best instead of God's best, God comes to you today and he says, I see you. I see the way in which you are running and I want to give you a new name and I want to set you on a new path and I want you to start pursuing me instead of your own best. And the way in which God gives us a new name is through the person and the power of Jesus Christ. That when you and I say yes to Jesus, what we learn is that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. God wants to change your name from sinner to saint, from broken to whole from one who is without a father, from one who feels like you are an outcast to a son or a daughter of the king of kings. But beloved people, what it requires of us is to stop running and to start running to God because he is the one who ultimately can make the changes. He is the one who can set us on a new path. And so you and I, if we choose to say yes and to trust in him, what we see is that it's he who has called our name, who has said, I see you. I saw you even before you were born. I saw the choices that you've made, but I want you to know you've never run too far from me, that I am here, that I love you, and I want to give you a new name. I want you to start pursuing me patiently. Other people, I don't know if you feel like you've been running from God. But I pray that this is a morning where you say, I want to run to God. And I want to experience all the blessings and all the promises that he has for me because I'm going to pursue everything patiently. I want to give you Maybe an opportunity to pause and to pray. And maybe there are some areas in your life where you've said, God, I've tried to take control and I've done some things on my own and you know what, I've made some mistakes. But I've, I've heard today and I know it's never too late to start over. It's never too late to return and to pursue God. And so I don't know what that is what it is that you're wrestling with, what it is that you're struggling with. My guess is that all of us are struggling with something this morning that we need to say, God, I'm going to give this over to you and I want to pursue you this morning. And so in these moments as I pray and as I offer just an opportunity, maybe for a few moments of just reflection and silence for you just to be thinking, Lord, here are some areas that I want to give over to you. So would you join me in prayer? Lord, you are a name changer. You want to set us on a new path. And maybe some of us this morning, maybe we feel like we've been running from you, God. And and maybe we've been running for so long for our lives that we have never said, 
Jesus, I want you to come into my life. I've, I've messed up. It's time for me to fess up. And it's time for me to return and to repent and to say, you know what? I don't want to run from you. I want to run to God. And, and maybe today is that day when this is going to be the first time when you say, Lord Jesus, I want to have a relationship with you. God, I thank you for the way in which you've seen me, in which you have pursued me, that we're never too far out of your sight. And Lord, this morning, maybe some of us have these areas where we followed you, and we've said yes to Jesus in that relationship, but we've kind of gone off track. We've done things on our own. And Lord, this morning, maybe in the quietness of our hearts, we just say, Lord, these are some areas where I've pursued my best instead of waiting for your best. And so this morning, God, we give these things over to you. God, what we would pray is that though we may have experienced pain along the way, that God, as a result, you're bringing change. And this change is going to bring incredible blessings to our families, to ourselves, and maybe to the people that are around us because you've set us on a new path and you've, you've changed our name and that, Lord, ultimately all we're asking is to be in the very center of your very perfect will. Lord, we don't want to run too far ahead. And we don't want to lag too far behind. But as we pursue you patiently, may we always be in the center of your perfect will. And we pray that all in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.